So these guys basically just did the presentation. And uh, did you notice the reference to Eric's substation? Yeah. No, Eric's Electronics. Eric's Electronics. So uh, the synchronicities have been pretty wild and this has really been a long journey. And uh, the title of this presentation is The Borderlands of Nikola Tesla's Resonant Transformer. So what I'm going to do is kind of uh, set the stage by going through uh, uh, little introduction onto uh, of kind of what uh, the direction of this presentation is all about. Excuse me a second. And then after I go through an introduction, then uh, we'll bring up uh, Eric. Will continue more on the technical side of things uh, regarding this project, and then after that. We're going to uh, take a break, go back to the back, and uh, do some demonstrations. And if you don't have a good view of what we're going to be demonstrating back there, don't worry. You know, we're going to be here all weekend, and uh, we'll be doing some demonstrations at the breaks and, and doing this all weekend. And feel free to ask um, questions you know, throughout the weekend. And then we'll be able to take you kind of around the rack units and the, uh, the smaller setup. So this project um, has been ongoing for several years, but it was really only in the last year um, that we've uh, kind of brought it to completion for at least a small-scale demo, which we'll get into. Um, take this warning seriously because some of these exper experiments can be pretty lethal with operating uh, these high-voltage, high-frequency systems. And, uh, you know, please only try to do this if you are qualified, if you have experience with these type of systems, because it, it is lethal and it could be very dangerous. Um, today what we're going to kind of cover is going to be broken into two different parts. The first part is kind of the introduction that I'll walk you through, and then uh, we're going to get started with Eric. Uh, division one is going to be the journey, and he's going to be talking about the border lens of electricity. A lot of you, raise your hand if you've heard of the cosmic induction generator, at least in in concept or so the cosmic induction generator is something that Eric has uh, spent uh, decades uh, working on and we're going to be uh, going into that in the technical details and showing a, a demonstration of what this kind of means. Is anybody familiar with some of the oddball strange kind of work that uh, Thomas Edison was involved in? Do you know he that he was actually uh, working on making a telephone that could talk to the dead? Raise your hand if you heard of that. Handful of you. And so this is, uh, yeah, Edison's own secret, and uh, it's kind of a contraption, not going to go into any of the details on it. I wish I had the second page, which is missing from the uh, uh, copyright owner's um, website, but uh, he literally was looking to talk to the dead, and back in these days, spiritualism and a lot of these kind of things were um, fairly common, and a lot of, lot of uh, you know, spiritual or ghostly type of experiences were attributed to the ether and all these kind of things, and you know, a lot, a lot of these ideas kind of uh, fell to the side. Um, what's interesting is, uh, raise your hand if you know who Charles Proteus Steinmetz is. So er Eric is uh, the le world's leading authority on the work of Steinmetz, who was a uh, mathematical genius from Germany, who I believe was um, hired by GE to possibly kind of crack Tesla's patent and to maybe develop a math model to make his polyphase systems engineerable and that kind of thing. You know, Eric could obviously give the uh, authoritative, you know, definition on what he was doing, but over the last several years with Eric's work with the math, he actually brought Steinmetz's work to completion. Now, here's kind of how I got uh, steered sideways into the so-called borderlands. First of all, I had my own experiences, but I was very conservative in, from the scientific engineering standpoint. Tesla was already going farther than most people go, but that were conservative. But I stuck with that one in a conservative manner, as I think people know. 
The integratron is an enigma, but I figured out its basic principle of operation. Uh, I perceived it as a apparatus for going from one point in space to another point in space without going in between. So I've, when I was uh, gathering material for my paper called The Revival of the Science of Electricity in the Digital Age, I found a guy that had all the gems that I've been waiting for my whole life. His name is Gustav Le Bon. And he came up with this statement of electricity allows for the connection between two worlds, the ponderable and the imponderable. And that's exactly what the theme is here. Electricity is the gateway. And Reich was the one that really quantified the whole thing in my mind. This is uh, one of his ergonomic potential measuring tubes. It appears to be in the form of a Geiger tube, but it also has the looks of a Farnsworth tube. He's using aluminum plates, which are, are basically somewhat photoemissive, or at least they generate secondary electrons. So without knowing if the tube's vacuum or gas or what have you, but if you take a standard Geiger-Muller tube and you look at its construction, it's not much different than this other than there's a complete cylinder surrounding the anode wire. And Reich found that, the, that these particular uh, discharge tubes, ionization tubes as they're called, um, after being exposed to uh, the flux of orgone for a lengthy period of time, took on whole new characteristics. So there's almost whole avenue of research right there. But it was not intended to generate any actual luminal or creational processes. So this was um, at the Integratron. Uh, the coil form was made by Van Tassel for one of these cardboard tube stupid coils. So I tore all that up because I could get sparks and voltages much higher without any of that cardboard tube and kind of blew Don Lockwood's mind when I just took all the cardboard tube and the rest of the stuff and threw it to the side and, and just used this coil form and I was getting sparks three times the length that was all that car cardboard tube. This was the primary of the cardboard tube but it was the extra coil on my experiments. So I was able to really move forward when uh, the couple of years I was at the Integratron. Uh, a lot of people were showing up with equipment so this is uh, there was a, a very powerful apparatus developed there, and uh, these are some of the images in the light bulb that we got. Never really got a galaxy, but got a lot of interesting stuff. This was uh, about a five kilowatt unit. Here's kind of, you can see the uh, resonant coils off to the side. It's got kind of, looks like this brain, you know, with all the dendrites and everything. It's def there's no denying that it's an organic form. Here's one that starts to go into, starts to look like a galaxy. In general, the, uh, the numerical magnitude of the time constant is pretty much proportional to the diameter of the coil and the number of turns, which means that the frequency is basically proportional to the inverse of the diameter and the inverse of the number of turns. When you're using these transformers, if you leave them unloaded, they might go into Tesla mode in the windings and incinerate themselves and you definitely don't want to do that with the last transformer on Earth. So what I have here is a 2,400 volt light bulb consisting of 20, 120 volt light bulbs hooked in series and I believe this loads it to uh, a couple hundred watts. So it's kind of like a safety valve and also uh, an indicator is the brighter the light bulbs the more power it's putting out. That's a closer view. That again was kind of difficult to figure out how to get all that in that tight little box because the voltages are pretty high here. You've got to have substantial clearances. This is uh, the back of it. The rectifier in this case is its own rack panel. It didn't have to get built into the, uh, the frame. It's only one transformer, and then, of course, it then chokes and capacitors and diodes. And then in the foreground is the medium voltage rectifier. 
And uh, that ends this part of the presentation. So this is basically two extra coil arrangements where the current coils are facing each other, the potential coils are basically facing out, and um, if you have like a radio transmitter, for example, why do you need a spark gap in a primary and a secondary when you can just go to these? So eliminating the primary and secondary and any associated losses and uh, anything like that, um, it's a lot more efficient. It allows you to get to unprecedented levels of uh, resonance, magnification, magnification being if you put one volt into it, maybe you can get 500 or 600 volts out of it. We're getting magnification factors of around, um, I don't know, 500, so for or 550 I think was maybe about the most. But it's operating different from just a step up coil, you know, if you take 12 volts, put it into an ignition coil, you get 15,000 volts. But the way these operate are, are uh, quite a bit different. There we go. We're ignited. Now, keep, now we need the lights out. You mean you want the batteries? Yeah. We need the lights out now. We so the lights, by lighting please. the bulb, hold on. By lighting the bulb getting close to it, it's going to change the frequency. And so each time he pulls it away a little bit, I have to retune into that frequency. <coughs> All the lights off. Except the spotlights. Except the spotlights. Okay, we're right there. Steady. Not too close. There we go. Now, it's, now energy is starting to disappear in the counter space. The transmitter is delivering power to the other side right now. Take the light, pull the light over there. So this one we see the is taken away. So the music is coming out of the plane. What? Plasma plane. So you know that purple is really not a neon color. Hold it up and see if it's getting plenty hot. Okay. So this is kind of a trip. Okay, so that's normal. This is what everybody is used to. And I don't know what, what would this be? Uh, argon helium or something? Well, it's probably neon. It's doing the same because it's longitudinal. There's a little, this is a Tesla ball. You got the little blues and then you got the oranges, you know, which are kind of like the neon would do in you know, a high frequency situation. But then when it's in that lot, this main field, it does things that, uh, that I've never seen before, but Tesla talked about. This is kind of the first time. I got the modulation to involve you. Here we go. You can see standing up. It's starting to go into the transformation. Well, you see the color change? Yeah. I think we'll be thankful for the work we got. Yeah.